Hello and good evening. Today my guest is Professor Eil Weizmann, who is Professor of Spatial and Visual Cultures at Goldsmiths University in London. He is an extremely active writer and engaged and has been engaged in outlining and analyzing what has been going on on the ground and in space in Israel-Palestine. His two earlier books, Hollow Land, Israel's Architecture of Occupation, was received very willingly by a whole group of people who had not thought about architecture in this way uh, before. Another of his books, The Least of All Possible Evils, Humanitarian Violence from Hannah Arendt to Gaza, uh, discusses how people are capable, the philosophical underpinnings to justifying wars and violence, uh, and what are the arguments uh, used. El, welcome. Uh, to, to, to be here, Tarek. To this. I want to dis start by discussing the horrendous campaign that is being waged by Western governments, starting with the White House, extending to the European Union, France and Britain in particular, where the campaign for boycott, divestment and sanctions that was seen by its founders as the only non-violent way to put pressure on the Israeli regime and those who back it. And the success of this movement has been such that the Israeli government, of course, unsurprisingly, has waged a huge campaign against it, but is now putting enormous pressure on the United States and on the European countries to illegalize it, to say that it's not kosher, it's impermissible, it's a form of anti-Semitism. And quite a few publications have uh, uh, taken uh, this up. Of course, in countries like South Africa, this is seen as a big joke, and that's where the movement has been uh, most successful. Mm -hmm. But how do you explain the hysteria over BDS? Uh, the Palestinians were not allowed to wage armed struggle because that was terrorism. They were not allowed to protest peacefully because that could lead to terrorism. So they organize a campaign, totally peaceful, putting economic sanctions in place from below, something the governments refuse to do, and they're still being attacked now for uh, uh, anti-Semitism. How do you see this? Yeah, I think it, it seems to me that um, the European support uh, for uh, the State of Israel's campaign against BDS signals to me that Europe and the U.S. has given up on ending the occupation, on ending the domination of Palestinians in 48, and in fact has given up on this conflict. Uh, and you can see it also in the way that uh, the political uh, discourse is uh, panning out uh, in Israel. There is no party right now uh, of the kind of the, the Zionist, even in the Zionist left, uh, that would uh, promote it would work uh, for this for these very simple and reasonable aims of ending the occupation ending the domination of Palestine and Israel uh, and uh, in all areas that are under Israel control including uh, Gaza so the, the strength of the BDS campaign on the one hand and of all sort of other legal actions uh, against Israel in the international, in the various international forums, in the UN, uh, things that should not appear at all as being controversial are being made criminal because they are the last challenge, in fact, to Israeli hegemony uh, in the area. And uh, I think that um, this effectively create a very big division between governments and their citizens. Because if you ask people here in Europe, if you ask most Europeans, uh, if you would ask now most people in, in American campuses, uh, they would not support that politics and policy. Uh, so 
Effectively, uh, the support for BDS, the very essential support for BDS, is simultaneously, simultaneously now became um, a challenge both to the State of Israel and to its domination, to its colonial practices, and to um, the European and American hegemony in, in, in basically governing and managing this occupation. It is a double-edged protest, and this is what makes it incredibly urgent um, to support. Uh, by supporting now BDS as a French citizen, you are, you are actually violating French law, but you are also protesting not only French support to Israel, but its entire Middle East politics, which rests on the support, on, on Israeli support. So in effect, the BDS movement has now, uh, because the, uh, the alignment of, uh, of Europeans and American, uh, the political class, uh, against the BDS, it became a much more revolutionary force. Uh, it became more, its stakes are much higher than uh, if it would only engage uh, with Palestine. And I think that there is, um, it is moving into a moment when it starts resembling something like the general strike. Mm. Uh, only a strike cutting off labor relation, cutting off production, cutting off in that respect cultural production and uh, cultural and economical exchange with Israel could effectively lead to the production of something else. So it's not only, you know, people criticize the BDS and say, well, it's negative action. It just simply allows click activism and people to, by not doing, to uh, support the Palestinian cause, which I think is wonderful. I mean, it's wonderful if it allows a kind of a broad uh, base and, and uh, it, it, it kind of accounts for the popularization uh, of the movement. But effectively, if you think of it as a general strike, it's also a site of production. It is a moment where we get organized. Uh, and I think that what we need to do is to use the BDS movement to produce something else. If we say that collaboration, that discussion, that cultural exchange, that economical exchange, that buying from Israel the fruits of its experimentation on Palestinians, buying from Israel the software that was developed in checkpoints and in managing the Palestinian register and in spying on Palestinian telephones. And, and people here think it's great product because it's been tested uh, on the Palestinians and, and this is something that should uh, be bought and, and, uh, and traded and you know, invested on and, and be on the stock market and universities should invest there. Um, uh, you know, the, the money that they have uh, in there. Everybody think this is great. Uh, we need to say, no, we stop that, but we don't only stop those things, we start producing something else. We can write a history again in which we can analyze both those economical connections that support uh, the occupation, but also produce culture in general. We need to see that as a site of production, BDS, and I think its revolutionary uh, potential is incredible. And, and now it is at a position of, uh, of growing uh, into a universal movement that, uh, that actually has uh, also the governments that support Israel at its aim. This is a fascinating uh, way of looking at it. And uh, linked to that, the other question is raised that the contradictions of the Israeli regime, despite the huge support it has in the West and, you know, from within the Arab world, that there is no force within apart from the Palestinian people who are left to oppose the Israelis. And as you said earlier, the Europeans and the Americans have accepted that the occupation is final, nothing's going to be done. The Israelis took dignitaries to the Golan Heights uh, just to say that this is now also part of Israel and the international community, i.e. the United States and the Europeans should recognize it. And of course, the Americans gave a token statement saying, no, we can't recognize this. But de facto, uh, they've got what they've wanted, a greater Israel. But the contradictions that lie within it 
is that despite the oppressive architecture that you write about, symbolized by the wall which they have built to divide Palestinian from Palestinian uh, and to keep some Palestinians out, what can they do now to stop the growing movement for saying this is our one land, it can't be divided, the two-state solution is finished. I was talking to Palestinians, Syria, you know, leading Palestinians uh, not so long ago, who will not say it in public because it means surrender. They think it could be seen as that. But in private, they say there's no other solution but a single-state solution with equal rights for all, and that ultimately this is what we're going for. And this is what many of them think. But the only way to stop that, I mean, I hate to be ultra-dramatic and sensational, is by wiping the Palestinians out completely. I mean, the question they must be discussing is wiping them out, pushing them into other Arab countries, killing more and more each day, so that they shrink and shrivel away. Do you think this is possible? I think Israel is now in a situation where, having given up on partition, both the left and the right, um, they have they face a problem, and it's a management problem. It's an architecture. It's a spatial problem of how to uh, govern those that are non-citizens, or if they are citizens, they are citizen level B, C, or D, or however you want to call it, but but definitely not equal citizens, even those uh, Palestinians from '48 from. Uh, the areas that uh, remained uh, in Israel control after the 49 ceasefire. Israel is now very much looking at, at, at Europe and, uh, and kind of being quite content with the way that the Europeans, uh, so in some places, especially in Central East uh, Europe and uh, in, in, by far-right parties uh, throughout, uh, actually proposed to, to deal with, with the refugees that are within, I as non-citizens, on a permanent basis. The hope is that worldwide, a kind of a system of government of the poor, of the refugee, of people that come from other places without rights, uh, would emerge that would allow Israel to remain what it is without having to actually physically push the Palestinians out of the, out of the borders, I need to manage them. And I think that uh, this is really at the forefront of, um, of where political thinking is, because the minute that you give up on the occupation and give up on a single democratic state, you're faced with a very technical problem. It would produce its own political philosophy, its own political sensibility, its own laws, uh, in a sense. And, and you mentioned the wall before, and, and I think that's, there's a... The, you know, there's a very simple way to look at the wall is that kind of linear thing that divides parts of the West Bank from others, etc. And there's a way to look at the wall as the physical, the sharp end of a politics of separation mm. that, um, that is pervasive, that is overall in Israel-Palestine. The, the wall itself has never been a single linear thing that we imagine it to be. It's always been a system of separation that is enacted by all sorts of barriers um, that initially are physical, a like concrete and barbed wire that now surround various neighborhoods in Jerusalem and various uh, neighborhoods inside 48, inside uh, uh, Palestine, between Caesarea, between the city where our prime minister uh, lives. It's, it's a kind of, uh, you know, kind of a rich man's town. Uh, and a very, one of the poorest uh, towns, uh, Palestinian towns next to it, they've built a big earth dike that separates them. Uh, in so-called divided cities like Lod, uh, there are people themselves are putting barriers. And you understand that the wall is simply a kind of a system of a politics of separation. Separation is apartheid. Uh, you know, the Israeli version of apartheid is different. It, it has different characteristics. It's a different dish made out of the same ingredients than the South African apartheid. But it is a politics that is based on separation. Uh, and that separation in space 
leads to separation in law, separation in budget, separation in regulation of movement, separation that is um, on almost any kind of frame uh, that it exists. Now, this is something that I see rather than, uh, to, to, to return to the beginning of our conversation, rather than being scandalized, is seen as a very good idea. Right? We have a system of managing people that has been honed, that has been perfected there. The control on Palestinian is almost absolute. Even if you, we see here and there acts of resistance, um, to think that this is uh, that uh, three million Palestinians now under occupation, another million and a half uh, in, in, in 48, uh, and so little resistance is happening, you can see that the system of domination is actually operating. Uh, so I see that going the other way. Rather than the Europeans are saying to the Israelis, undo it, the Israelis are saying to Europeans, look what we can do. And you can learn from us. And you can learn from us. You can buy it. Uh, you can trade on those uh, commodities, uh, etc. And if anyone would say, don't buy those things that have been perfected by an apartheid regime in an apartheid situation that has been tested on Palestinian civilians, weapons, technologies, mainly software, that um, manage a problem that is very similar to the European problem and, is, and Europe is eager to consume that. So what are we saying? We're saying don't buy or don't have your pension fund invest in things like that and they say this is anti-Semitism. It is completely ridiculous. Uh, and I think what is required is an action, a civil society action against the states not only against the Israeli states, but against the states that support it. And the Saudis, completely given up on, on liberating Palestine, completely given up even on ending the occupation, even on their own peace uh, plan, they've given up, they've given it a, a kind of a free hand, and, and they're trying to introduce a new discourse in the Arab world that would accept Israel, that would start accepting and dealing uh, with that regime that uh, suppresses, tests, and kills their brothers in Palestine. And what which, is this? And, and which could turn out to be probably the most successful colonialist regime in history, if it carries on like this and, and manages to pull it off. The question is, will it pull it off? What can stop it? Well, I think that there is, um, that there is a great conflict now going on in Europe on initially a conflict that, that played out from the center. And, and, and I accept my, my liberal friend's uh, opinion that fascism needs to be fought from the center. Let's, 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 let's grant them this, right, that, that the Merkel and all those people that kind of discipline somehow um, the visible part, rising fascism in Europe is a step towards uh, further, further work uh, on the subject. But I think we need to think about those things together. Mm. I think that, that the rising fascism in Europe and the absolute, the fascism that goes mad now in Israel, that does not bother to hide itself anymore. I remind you that several weeks ago when an Israeli soldier shot in the head a wounded Palestinian teenager on the ground in Hebron, he's been cheered by the entire country including by the Prime Minister who, who called to strengthen uh, the parents of that soldier when he was investigated by uh, the military police. Uh, so there is a, a, a fascism going wild in Israel. There's fascism around the margin uh, in Europe, but it's the same battle because one supports the other. One is tied in with the other. How can that thing be done against the will of the people in Europe? against the will of the young people in the US. How can that be done? What, what democracy is worth if even if the, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of European would support the end of the domination of Palestinians, and that cannot be done? What, 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 what mechanism stops it if democracy, if simple democratic census would say to you, that is what people want? Uh, we cannot trust our government for that. And we need to basically protest simultaneously against our government, against the Israeli government, and understand that as, a single, as, as, as different manifestations of a single struggle. And I think that the BDS movement, being a civil society movement, 
being no, a, a non-violent movement, non, definitely not uh, non-armed, uh, and uh, operating on a very intellectual, uh, financial, political, cultural level is really pointing the way for us as citizens to act against our government and corporation. This is, if you want Palestine to be a laboratory for something, it is also a laboratory for resistance. Let's talk for a minute about your own work. Um, in your earlier books, you have explained how this domination is exercised spatially through architecture, through various other mechanisms. Then you moved on to explain the so-called philosophical underpinnings of the dominant ideology as far as Israel is concerned. What are you working on now? What is your main project now? So right now I'm working on another manifestation of a kind of a relation between a local scenario, very local scenario, the Bedouin land struggle in the Al-Nakab desert uh, in the south of Palestine, the Negev desert. Yes, which is hardly covered in the media. Hardly covered, covered yeah. but it is the most inspired <coughs> political struggle that, um, uh, that I can see right now. Uh, and, and its relation to, as, and I use it also as a critique of dominant climate change discourse, but I'll explain that later. I'll, I'll tell you first why I find the Bedouin struggle so uh, uh, inspiring. Um, because the Bedouins, and in particular, I tell a story of a single village, the village of Al Araki, uh, in the very northern threshold of the Negev uh, desert. These people have returned they have not talked about the right of return, they have not debated, they have not asked for it. They have returned 100 times and they've built a village there. And 101 times their village has been destroyed, bulldozed, dragged away, people put in handcuffs, uh, handcuffs uh, thrown women and children into police cars and, 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 and dragged away. And then the next week they returned again. And, um, and I think that there is something in the Bedouin struggle that in the kind of its direct action uh, that is very much inspiring for me. There's also various contradictions in this story because you know in the, in the history, in the short history of Zionism, uh, Ben-Gurion and, and the early Zionists are kind of saw the Bedouins as the good Arabs. Yes. Uh, not only they saw them as the good Arabs, they saw them, they saw themselves, they saw their ancestors when they came back to Palestine and saw Bedouins, they said, this is Isaac and Jacob and Abraham, etc. And Ben-Gurion went so far as to suggest that they share the same DNA and that perhaps we should convert them into Jews, etc., etc. Uh, they are the people that are being drafted into the Israeli army, i.e. they kill and die for the Israeli state. Uh, they used in the forefront in, in governing Palestinians in the occupied territories. Um, but these are also the people that resist in a very effective way uh, and challenge uh, the Israeli hegemony in a very effective way. And one of the reasons that they succeed to do it in the desert is that although the Israelis can uh, expel them, can destroy their homes, uh, can kill some of them, can can, can make some of them refugees in, in other places, can harass them continuously, they cannot settle effectively the desert right now because there is another push force that is happening. So although Zionism wanted to roll the desert, to push the desert southwards, you remember all the kind of the school book metaphors of making the desert bloom effectively, the, the greatest definition of climate change I've heard, right, making the desert bloom, now the desert pushes back up. Uh, so uh, farmers are losing money. Uh, the, 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 the forests that are being planted on former Bedouin land in order to expel them, in order to erase their traces, the saplings are dying out. Uh, and there is a kind of a threshold in which colonialism and climate change those two stories entangle. Oh. And then I say, we need to basically start thinking about climate change in a different way. 
So even the most um, militant of climate change activists and, and scholars protesting it, etc., I think make a very fundamental mistake. They all write about climate change as if it was the collateral damage of history. So fossil fuels, industrialization, creation of wealth and transport, and shit happens. The, the planet, um, you know, greenhouse effect happens and the planet gets warmer. However, if you tell the same story from the point of view of colonial history, you would see that since early 18th century, colonial administrators, home de letter, scientists, uh, and farmers were actually, who, who invented the term climate change, they're the first to have used it, used it as a project. It was a colonial project of changing the climate in places that were simply too harsh for the colonialists, in deserts, making the desert bloom. In the threshold of, um, of the forest, it was about deforestation um, along the, uh, the, the threshold of the rainforest. And, uh, and, in, and always that, that process was involved in the expulsion and murder of native, native of native people. I want to ask you just one question, which I should have asked earlier. How did you yourself get radicalized? You were born in Haifa. What was it that changed you? Um, I, I, I cannot point to a particular moment. Uh, but if you want a kind of a, a little anecdote, um, after Rabin uh, was killed, and I, I was in the protest uh, at the time, I was in the square uh, when, when, when he was assassinated, I effectively, um, the following day, I drove to, uh, to Ramallah. And as an architect, uh, as I was an architecture student at the time, volunteered at the Palestinian Ministry of Planning. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm here to work. And you know, at the beginning, like, what, what do you do as a, as a young architectural student? You, you ink up plans, you, uh, uh, you, know, you do very technical stuff that architects do, until somebody realized uh, that as an Israeli, I could be much more useful. And they said to me, why don't you go to Israeli universities and archive and bring us the plans of our cities that Israelis have held away from us? Uh, because even though there was the Oslo Accord and even though they were negotiating and giving up partial uh, autonomy over various places, they were not giving the maps. And Palestinians were still conducting planning on old Jordanian maps that from 67, from the, from the mid-60s. Uh, so I was kind of like on a, a small-scale industrial espionage, going into you know open open uh, archives, bringing up the plans back, but realized something very important about the power of control of space and its representation. And then um, when I finished, after a few years, I finished. I studied here actually at the Architectural Association. After a few years, I finished my uh, architectural degree, and went back to Palestine and uh, was faced with another kind of strange commission. Uh, this was B'Tselem at the time, uh, the largest human rights group uh, working on the occupied territories. And they asked me if I think I could write a human rights report that for the first time would not incriminate only politicians and military men in, in violations, but architects. Can you look at crimes committed on the drawing board? And I thought that is a great challenge. And the task was to bring an architect, to put an architect on a dock of the International Court uh, in The Hague and to look at crimes that are undertaken by the way that the lines are being drawn, by the way that the neighborhood or a settlement is designed intentionally in order to surround and envelope and bisect and suppress and control a Palestinian neighborhood. And I thought these are architectural crimes. Uh, that architectural violence perhaps is, is slow, is incremental, but it's as lethal as the kind of violence that is exercised by tanks and airplanes. Uh, thank you very much. This has been <clears throat> a really fascinating and important discussion. Uh, we haven't had enough of it, so we will drag you back here very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Tarek.